Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. My, uh, I'm your host, Doug Sharp. Your call is Rich Gear here with you, and uh, we have a guest who's been on our show before. Derek, glad to have yep, you back. Nice on. to be back, guys. Yeah, yep. glad, glad, to, glad to see you. And, Hello. Uh, you know, and so Doug, um, we we're going to talk about a honey of a situation today. Is that is that what we're going to talk about? Uh, I guess that's the top? buzz. Yeah, that's yeah, the buzz. Yeah. yeah well, what yeah. what I've assigned Derek to do is uh, he's our resident engineer, and and so uh, I just gave him a, a little bit of a uh, interesting thing to ponder as to if he was a. Uh, mechanical engineer, and or he's actually electrical engineer, right? Uh, yeah. That's what you do. And yes. uh, what uh, I was thinking is that uh, the honeybee is a really a, an amazing little creature. Yes, and it, is. it does a, a, a lot of things in the environment. To, uh, you know, if you were God and you were uh, trying to devise a uh, mechanism to uh, have all these different materials transported back and forth from uh, flower to flower so that you'd yeah. be able to uh, pollinate them and, get, and keep them uh, live. Uh, he would uh, have to devise some sort of a little uh, flying mechanisms to take things back and forth like that. Yeah, I got to thinking of it. Um, you know, uh, we've got these little drones now that'll fly around yeah. and with the cameras on them and yeah. uh, and um, I know they've been able to scale some of them down quite a bit yep. but um, I don't think we've yet come up with something in it like a, you know, a flying machine of the size of a honeybee or that of a a gnat or even something s s smaller. They keep probably like these like nanobots or something like that, right? Right, yeah. Well, I think uh, what I came up with was back in 2001, uh, UC Berkeley had a researcher that was designing a mechanism that was uh, had a wingspan of like an inch and or 25 centimeter or millimeters okay. and it had a uh, very low power actuator that they, that they could uh, vibrate the wings at approximately 150 hertz and it was only 10 milliwatts of power draw. And the reason why the power draw is so low is because a, a buzzer or that type of circuit actually is very power efficient. Uh, ideally, it takes no power to run a buzzer because you're, you're throwing back inductance and capacitance back and forth. The energy is being transferred back and forth between inductance and capacitance. So all you really, mm -hmm. it, 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 it conserves its own energy. All its loss is friction and the actual okay. work. I say, man, I thought we were in a perpetual motion machine here. Right, like work that's being done. done. So yes, yeah. it, it does consume power. So uh, they've been able, they were able to do this in software and there's actually an actuator that will, will do that. And they probably, over the course of the last 15 years, have probably improved upon that. So you can get a flight down to that small scale, but that's still quite a bit larger than a honeybee. And it's going to be a lot heavier, or a lot, a lot heavier than a honeybee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because a hen honeybee is only like a, a tenth of a gram. I mean... Well, yeah, and it was t I was reading in this article, Doug, you, I think you printed it out. It's like, what is it, 60 or 80 percent of pollinization is done by honeybees? Right, yeah. I mean, I, and it's not, we're talking about vegetables and fruits, and I mean, it's not, I, I always thought honeybees just went to flowers and got some nectar and you know, and, and came back to the hive, but apparently they pollinate a lot of things. I, I did not realize they also, that. They also gather water. Mm -hmm. Water is a major component in everything that's, that the bee does. It, it needs, of course, to consume water. It needs to bring water back to the hive for cooling. Water needs to, is partly production of honey, and uh, everything depends upon water. So they're out there getting water, too. They have and to find water and sources. And the thing about it, when I read this, too, and I, and, and, our, our, our camera guy was a little skeptical of this, uh, this thing, was that, that they were not of American origin, they're like European origin. I, I, I don't know how that's true or not, but I go, well, who pollinated before? Well, I guess it was Yellow Jackets, right? They're, yeah. I mean, what was that, headed to America? I don't know, there must have been bees of some sort here. I'm, I'm, don't have any information on that, yeah. but uh, that was kind of surprising to me too. But yeah, I suppose I it's talking yeah. a lot of animals, a lot of organisms were introduced by uh, back in the day when the, all the explorers were here and uh, people brought, I guess I would imagine they were keeping bees. Uh, for right. some reason I seem to think they were keeping bees back in Egypt in those days. Yeah, back in, again, but that's over in Africa. Yeah, area. so somehow the beekeeper or whatever brought bees over, introduced bees, I don't know. I'm not yeah, sure I recently had to do a project right. about Native American life and there's nothing in there about but what that, harvesting honey. It's what, they, they do maple syrup, but they didn't do anything with, there's no honey 
your records, at least in Michigan. But that, that shows us how adaptable yeah. the bee is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a lot of the research over the last few days that I have done is how would I construct a bee, right? So yeah. a, bee, a bee has to navigation. Be or not to be. Yeah, to be okay. or not to be a bee, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Bees have navigation. They have to be able to see where they're going. They also, a very, very important aspect of a bee is odor detection because they actually oh, yeah. smell the flowers. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously they have to fly also and they need to be able to cool themselves off. And and the most vision sense, visual sense, don't they have? It, yes, it's, it's very a, specialized okay. vision sense that uh, it's actually uh, the compound eye that a lot of insects have. Yes. Um, it's uh, made up of uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of what's called omatidia. Or, 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 oh yeah, it's omatidia. And each one of those omatidia is one pixel like a vision wow. that picks up specialized. Each one of those omatidia now, or omatidium, has six to nine uh, uh, neurons that have to service it. So what you have, if you have 30,000 omatidia in a compound eye times six or nine, you could have a 300,000 input neural net that you're gonna have to service. Now, how, how would you uh, set up a circuit like that? I would use, a, uh, I would use what's called now a, uh, uh, a neural net, but it's, a, it's a, a false neural net. It's a one that we, mm -hmm. we produce as human beings. And you'd have to do that in software somehow. Um, they have, to give you a, a, a level of scale, in, uh, on a regular computer, you have a program called MATLAB that a lot of scientists and engineers work with, that I've worked with. And MATLAB will give you a neural network on the order of maybe 10, 10 mm -hmm. inputs. And I'm talking, I need about 300,000 inputs wow. to be able to do what a bee does. And that includes for vision, that also includes um, the, uh, the sensory for, the, for scent to for be able to pick up, or for or smell. Okay. Because actually a bee uses its antenna to smell. It has, each right. antenna has uh, between 160 and 170 receptors for odors. And it's gotta be able to distinguish between basically everything that you would smell hmm. flying around out in the, uh, the wilderness trying to find this particular flower. But what's good about the, the, what I call dual tech. In engineering, you always try to use dual tech. You try, always try to find two different technologies to make a detection of something, if not more. So they can see, and mm -hmm. if they see a color that interests them, they're smelling, to smell, mm -hmm. if it smells familiar. If it doesn't, it's not a flower, or it's okay. not a, so that's, you know. Hence, they're not trying to pollinate. So you don't have stuff. to see so well, <laughs> and you don't have to right. smell so well, but bees also have a very excellent uh, sense of taste, sense of smell because they're not only smelling for flowers, but they're also smelling the hive. They're smelling each other. They're smelling the organisms that are around yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So they're very, a very specialized sense of smell. Very important. Yeah, I think there's also a, a mechanism for communication between the bees that uh, they, uh, uh, there's been a number of programs that talk about the waggle that they do. Yeah, what I was gonna talk about before, we were talking about how, how where bees came from. Did bees, mm -hmm. were bees native to the United States? Well, if they weren't native to the United States, bees had to learn how to be here and be as successful as they are in the United States. That means mm -hmm. bees have to learn. The bees had to learn how to be. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And the whole basis of a, uh, a neural net is, mm -hmm. is kind of like the human brain. Bee has a small, very small brain. And uh, it, just like us, a bee, when it's first out of the hive, does not know everything that a bee needs to know. So it participates with the colony. Now a colony can be upwards of 30,000 to 60,000 bees. And among these bees, there's this whole socialization order and the bees learn and they're, they're smelling each other, they're touching each other, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're getting in, involved right. and they learn because, you know, a, a neural network learns kind of by experimentation. It's not just one directional, it's bi-directional, meaning mm -hmm. they just go out and fly around a little bit. And mm -hmm. If they're successful, um, you know, they, they establish a path through this neural net that's reinforced and has a feedback. Okay. That means, it, so whenever they have a successful path, that path is strengthened. When you say neural net, is that like the equivalent of a, of a brain? Is that what yes. It, okay. it right. has layers. It has okay. an input layer. It has the layers in between, which are called hidden layers. Those hidden layers have cells that have um, various weights of signal strength and connection. So a good connection has a good, strong 
input to output, you know, flow. But what you were saying earlier, you could do what, something about 10 and you need about 30,000, huh? Yeah, on, one, on, a PC, on a PC with MATLAB, you can do a, a neural net on the, uh, on the uh, order of about 10 inputs, mm -hmm. where I need about 300,000 300, to, to do a B justice, to do a B correctly. And that's just for the, the, the sight the piece of it, right? That's for the sight and the smell. And the sight and the smell. You know, and then now, you have to uh, navig now, a if you want to talk about navigation, yeah. um, it's been shown it's not, bees don't only use the sun, but mm -hmm. bees have been shown that they do use the sun. And there is a, a, a ring of, of specialized omatidia that, that kind of let, it's kind of like the bees' peripheral vision in a way. It's kind of an oversimplification. Okay. Yeah, okay. So bees are always aware of where the sun is. Mm -hmm. And they always, uh, um, they even have an internal way to, over time, as the sun's changing position in the sky, they 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 don't they tra they kind of inherently track that, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. it's because uh, the bee you know the sun's moving as the bees out there working, but they know that it's moving, and th they can compensate for that so they can navigate. Okay. Well, isn't evolution wonderful? It's great. <laughs> it only goes in one direction though, and a bee needs two directions. That's they right. need <laughs> a bee's a bee's who a bee is is established in its mind. And that develops, and it develops in forward time and in reverse time, because Whoa, okay. it's not just learning and if it screws up, it's dead. You mm -hmm. know, it has to learn and then it has to, and then the, you know, the information inside of a bee's brain is changing, it's dynamic. And, mm -hmm. and that's why it's successful. It's not because the bee was born knowing everything it needed to know and that's all it knows. Okay, and so a bee, is, a bee is more than just merely instinct. It's actually, you're, you're saying a bee actually learn, has yes. learned behavior then. I yes, did not know that's, but I mean, I was always kind of thought that, you know, pretty much all animals, some humans, pretty much uh, did base their life on instinct. Yeah. For birds the most part, birds are know? the same way. Birds have to learn the way south. Mm -hmm. They don't know the way south when they come out of the egg. Yeah, because I was wondering, I was the first one that got. What, not to change what, the subject, how but they that's another how, mm -hmm. how did they figure it out the first time? You know what I mean? You know, like, I, okay. So, and, and so if you uh, really want to. Uh, think about it. Uh, we're talking about something that had to have been intelligently designed by by God, and and it really points to uh, the uh, a, a loving God, uh, one that really has a uh, purpose for everything that He's made. It's not something that uh, is uh, He sort of thought up and uh, started going and then. Uh, over uh, millions of years, it sort of accumulated all this sort of thing. I think uh, what you uh, talked about is uh, this learned behavior uh, is sort of something that uh, uh, is part of uh, God's design and plan. It isn't isn't something that, uh, but uh, he, he has built within uh, all of his creatures a mechanism to uh, to learn things and to have uh, adaptation to its environment uh, because that that's part of uh, how how uh, each uh, creature becomes successful at what it, what it does. Well I, I find it remarkable you, you look at uh, the question that sort of begs the question is like why did God make it so complicated? Why didn't he just mm -hmm. make it straightforward? I think it goes back to the scriptures when it talks about the heavens declare his handiwork and the earth is supposed to. Mm -hmm. It's like I think you want to talk about loving God, why it's loving is because he designed everything for us to be able to look to it and say, there's something greater than us. Mm -hmm. And even in the simplest quote, simple, I put that in quotation mark, as we're finding out, it's not very simple, is it? You no, know? not at all. And yet even in the smallest part, he has developed uh, a creation and, and, and aspects to the creation that are interrelated, interconnected, but they declare his handiwork. They declare, I am God, and right. I love you I, so much. I wanted you to see the thing. And, and I think some of it, I think the Lord does things just for the enjoyment sake of it. Okay, I am an artist, and yes. you as an engineer, uh, there are things that we just enjoy because it gives us purpose, meaning, it, fulfillment. We enjoy doing things and, and love it when other people can see it. I think the Lord enjoys it when we look at what he's made 
and you go, wow! And there's a beauty. God, are you amazing? There's an artistic you know? beauty that uh, he's put into it, and it's something that you appreciate. All, you know, they have a wide variety of uh, colors of flowers, and in order for those flowers to exist, you have to have these uh, bees and flies and whatever else brings the, the pollination back and forth uh, between uh, the different uh, uh, flowers, and it, it makes it makes it all work and it carries seeds you know the, you have the birds that carry the seeds the uh, different things and but then what i find remarkable too though we were talking about it again before the show started is some of the products that bees produce yeah mm -hmm. are very useful for Everything. human beings mm -hmm. the bee pollen the royal jelly that is yes. used to create queen bees uh there, there's so many things that you can use i mean even there's one their their honeycomb was made out of this wax we mm -hmm. use beeswax. Beeswax. I mean, there's so many things, but I was reading about this this royal jelly. I was, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, even it helps with menopause. It helps with, and yet you can't synthesize it. You know, we no, can't, no, we, can't we don't make. Yeah. We can't make royal jelly. We can't, we can't make honey. It's I mean. more than the sum of its parts. There's something inside, right. maybe something we haven't identified yet, mm -hmm. but whatever it is. It's more than just the vitamin B vi or the, vi the B vitamins that are in it, or this or this others. I mean, they, they've isolated some of the components or a lot, or most of. Mm. But it's something. There's something more. Is it coenzymes? It's something we don't yes. know from an engineering standpoint. I bet that fascinates you. That yes. Idea, well, you know? one of the enzymes that bees use is called beta glucosidase, and that's one of the enzymes that I'm familiar with from my background in, in biomass, in biomass engineering. Um, this is a, a uh, an enzyme that breaks down. Um, what's called a, a very large complex sugars and, and breaks them okay. down into simple sugars that that uh, that can be used in, in further process for to make biofuels well it makes little pieces of glucose that's what it does mm -hmm. it cuts larger pieces into small pieces into single things really? like and then there's amylase there's uh, uh, several other uh, enzymes that bees have in their saliva in various concentrations depending on the bee depending on where they are what they need to do to um, take the, the, the pollen and t to take the, uh, the other substances and put that on their tongue and it changes and it works in, it's a way into I, the it's honey. Just, it's but then it's like something that bees make for the bees, you know, obviously all of us have had honey at some point or another and honey is, it's a wonderful thing, it's one of those, one of those sugars that are easily digestible, easily synthesized in their body. That's a natural it's, antibacterial, it's, yeah, too. Na yeah, mm -hmm. natural, natural antibacterial. And so, I mean, but I, I grew up with honey, but in the last 20 years, you've been hearing about bee pollen and, and the royal jelly, and I go, wow, are you kidding me? And the fascinating fact that is, that, I mean, they're not even native to this country. I go, this, this, is, this is quite an amazing thing. It's one thing I really want to talk about a little bit. I mean, we may, I may be jumping ahead, but it's the, the, the dying off of the bees in, in recent oh, yeah. years, which yeah. is really a tragedy. And uh, we talk about them being able to adapt, and they've been able to adapt for, for hundreds of years now here in America, right. but for some reason, the last 20, 30 years, there's been devastating blights and diseases and things that have really, really destroyed a lot of the bee colonies, 60% of it, you know. Has been yeah, the stresses against the bees are definitely increasing. Yeah. I don't think they're gone yet, but, but they're having a harder time surviving and keeping bee colonies going and I thriving. Know. yeah. And, uh, you know, like in the urban areas, especially, where they, mm -hmm. you know, have a lot of different things like uh, 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 smog and things of that sort, and that, that doesn't help them. But uh, I was interested to see that the, uh, even bee venom, the oh, yeah. thing, yeah. Uh, if, uh, if it, it, that can be actually be used to uh, f fight things like uh, arthritis, neuralgia, high blood pressure, high cho cholesterol, and even MS. Mm -hmm. And so um, they were, they were actually taking the, uh, the sting, the bee sting, the sting. Yeah, <laughs> and making it, uh, uh, they're finding all kinds of uses for it. And so, uh, and then, you were talking about the royal jelly. I was thinking of uh, reading all this, but there's just a whole. There's so much, I know. I, you I know, told it's a, a bunch of stuff. Well, the way you posed the problem to me the other day was uh, how I would make a 
a whole colony of mechanisms that will go out and get the pollen and get the water and get the nectar, bring it back to some central location where they make honey. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and uh, what, what that led me to was the idea or the fact that the whole reason or for the whole reason why bees make honey is to for life to propagate mm -hmm. life. Yeah. The honey is for the baby bees. Right, yeah. Primarily. Everybody eats the honey. The worker bees eat mostly the pollen and the nectar as they're working. Mm -hmm. Because a bee, we go back to how much power does a bee consume. You know, a bee mm -hmm. only consumes on the order of about 15, 16 calories a year. And that's really? an incredible low wow. amount of energy. Very low. But it's but it consumes like one tenth of its weight in pollen and in nectar a day, which is a lot if you think about mm -hmm. it. If you ate one tenth of your weight, that's a lot of food. For yeah. me, it's like yeah. 20 pounds of food. Yeah, and they, they're, and they're but they're blessed. burning, they're constantly burning yeah. it. Yeah. You know, and the best I could do with my, what I came up with with ideas from the internet was, you know, having this little 10 milliwatt mechanism with a little se a square centimeter solar cell sitting on its back, mm -hmm. you know, drawing 20 milliwatts, you know, from the yeah, sun. Yeah, they say you literally know. the worker bees work themselves to death. They, right. they, 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 They're they, constantly, they, constantly yeah. going. Constantly that's, that gives going. us to another thing, which is the, the, the amazing mystery of, like, if you could design it, but then how, when they burn out, does it replicate itself? Right, it, it won't. You know? It right. doesn't. But it removes a lot of problems. You have to worry about replica replicating yourself. All you're doing is going out and getting stuff and bringing it back. You're not really, and you're not really feeding bees. You're just everything, all the honey that's brought back is gone, is made to sell or whatever to produce. Now, uh, from a, a, a colony of about 300 or 30,000 bees, on the order of that, produces about 30 pounds of extra honey for harvest. Mm -hmm. wow. Whereas also, I'd say probably another 60 to maybe 100 pounds of honey per year goes to making new bees. Okay. Mm -hmm. So bees produce a fruit. Right. Bees produce an excess amount of honey. Bees don't just produce honey to feed themselves and that's it. Or even to propagate right, themselves. That's right. that's and it. They, they have a net profit, which you is look a principle at the, from that. I like that, yeah. yeah. If you look at the, uh, uh, anything like uh, in life, there's always something that uh, the fruit that's left over, you know, that yeah. uh, uh, isn't used. It's actually an unselfish piece of, of a tree where it produces a fruit, and that's for food for something else. Mm -hmm. And the reward the tree gets is that uh, maybe the seeds are propagated. Right. But uh, <coughs> uh, but what it's actually doing is producing something that's uh, that's beyond. The, the selfish purpose of the of the tree. Right. It's yeah. it, it's uh, something that uh, is be uh, available for use for for some other creatures. Yeah. Yeah, for something, uh, yeah, human beings for one. With, with we, you know, we have nothing to do with bees. Uh, you know, but hope. I don't know. I just hope they can solve the problem of uh, what's going on with the with the with the loss of the bees in recent years. Because right. Because that's been, a big deal. It's been drastic. It's really not. And you know, I don't know. Maybe every so often. Things attrition happens and it jumps down mm -hmm. and then and then it can build back up. I don't know if that's the case or not the case, but mm -hmm. I'm hoping it is the case that basically you go through the maybe the cycles where they just suddenly have a big big loss and then they come back. I mean, there's a lot of animals like that that right. you know we have we have tried to bring them back and some of them we've had some success with, but. Uh, the bee is a trouble one. I mean, I'm worried about the cheetah, for instance. Mm. Oh, you know? that's my favorite cat, the yeah. cheetah. And and there's there's only one bloodline now, and I'm going. Oh man, that's it, bad. It's it's not good, and I don't see how cheetahs are going to survive. But on the other hand, when I was growing up, the bison, they supposed to have fewer. I, I may have remembered this fact wrong, so the audience, please don't pull this again. But I remember <laughs> growing up thinking there were fewer than 50 buffalo in the world left. There was only 50 of them. And now we've got herds of tens of thousands, yeah, and they don't seem to up. be any, mm -hmm. they don't seem to be inbred or loss of genetic. We're trying to bring back the condor. They had 12 mm -hmm. of those, now they've got about 50 or 60 of them now. Mm -hmm. It's still pretty slow, but I'm saying, so maybe some things you can do. I, I'd like, I hope the bees can come back. I, I don't know. And uh, I'd like the cheetah to come back, too. That, I know that's a little sidebar of one of my 
favorite things yeah. too. Cheetah is your favorite cat. I, it is. I, 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 I've yeah. always been and fascinated with you know, the cheetah. The cheetah is uh, the only big cat that can be tamed. I didn't know that. You can tame a cheetah. cheetah yeah. I did not know that. I don't know if yeah. I want to though. There was a, a few miles per hour. Well, some friends of ours who actually went to the one of the same wild animal park that we went to, yeah. the, and the, they've actually got a tame cheetah there now. Really, yeah. man. And oh, yeah. so uh, I love that pet cheetah. It was showing, it was awesome. showing uh, the guy who uh, uh, the friends of ours who uh, uh, went there, and he was petting the, the tame cheetah. I don't know if I would pet it. I, I don't know. I'd, <laughs> Well, I'd want know. to, but I don't know. I just it's like we have cats, you know. They come from somewhere. Yeah. It was because I know I've heard of leopards being. <laughs> I would be the one that would bite. You, you can't tame. You can't tame leopards. Uh, no, uh, no, <laughs> that, can't that, tame but, uh, you see the leopards in these right. the Egyptian things, you know. Yeah, but uh, anyway, a little sidebar there, but it was kind of fun. So, well, Doug, on, on, we're, we're getting fast to the closing of the show. We're finding out. As good of an engineer as Derek you might be, you're telling us you can't get there from here. I, f I failed. I mean, it took, I, I, I had, what, six days to come up with a complete B solution, and I failed. I failed mm -hmm. miserably. Well, six days is down. Well, of course, God did everything in six mm -hmm. days. I'm supposed to be able to do it in six <laughs> days. Well, if you ask my boss at work, I'm supposed to get it done in six days. <laughs> yeah, that didn't work I'm out. held to a high standard. And, we, and you know what you're looking for to start with. Right, what yes, but it's amazing. It was an amazing table. problem. Um, one more little anecdote. If I was to try to do what Doug suggests, I would probably model it, model it after a airport with an air traffic controller with planes, independent planes and pilots going to destination A, coming back to destination B. I think that would be probably the closest the way I would model it. Mm -hmm. And an air traffic control tower with probably you know 50 computers, maybe a mainframe. You know, mm -hmm. that keeps track yeah. of the locations of stuff, but doesn't do everything. The individual planes and pilots have their own navigation and what have you. But each one of those solutions is like a PC or, a, you know, to be yeah, able we're not to get some of this. Those. We're not going to get something right. this little. It's going to be a lot, lot bigger area than, than what the beat was. So the, it's the closest I came up with was that, that, to what we're doing. But we're talking about something that's this big. It's compo uh, you know compared to something that's as right. big as this house, or you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's hard to scale that down. Well, we hope you enjoyed our uh, buzz tonight. We'll see you next time on Revolution Against so Evolution. Behave. <laughs>